Hi, everybody. Welcome to Bone to Pick. I am Michael Davis, and we are coming to you today from beautiful Burbank, California. And I am super happy to have our featured artist this month, one of the great tuba players of all time, Mr. Jim Self. Uh, Jim is an internationally renowned tuba uh, soloist. He's a solo artist, having recorded uh, 12 CDs, about ready to release his 13th CD. Uh, he has recorded on over 1,500 motion picture soundtracks, hundreds of television shows and CDs. He's had uh, many, many solos in major films, including uh, John Williams' Jurassic Park and the voice of the mothership from uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, as well as a solo on James Horner's Casper, uh, Mark Shaman's Sleepless in Seattle, Jerry Goldsmith's Dennis the Menace. He has recorded with a myriad of artists, including Cassandra Wilson, the great Klaus Ogerman, Randy Newman, Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, Don Ellis, the Los Angeles Philharmonic. That's just a partial list. Uh, he is the professor of tuba and chamber music at USC. He is the inventor of the fluba, which we will talk about <laughs> a little bit more, and it looks so cool. I'm very into that. Uh, he's composed uh, over 60 titles for various ensembles, from brass to woodwinds to strings. Uh, he has endowed multiple scholarships uh, for tuba players, young tuba players. Uh, he's also a performing artist for Yamaha. He's done pretty much everything you could possibly do on the tuba and then some and still going strong. Jim, thank you so much for uh, taking time to be with us on Bone to Pick today. What a great honor, Mike, to be a part of this, what an impressive series of people that you have seen on, on your, uh, thank on your you. every month. Yeah, yeah Thank you, great. Jim. I appreciate that. And uh, as I was mentioning, uh, uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten as many tuba uh, folks as we as I would like, but you are our second tubist with uh, Gene Picorni being the first. So I, like I said, we start at the top of the tuba oh, world. Well, so, um, Jim, let's just talk a little bit about your, uh, you grew up in Pennsylvania, and I know you uh, got degrees from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Catholic University, USC. Maybe tell us uh, what, what early on what made you gravitate towards the tuba. Well, I was a guitar player first. Oh, I right. started okay. at age nine, uh -huh. and uh, and I was never a very good guitar player. And later on, I became a bass player, like a lot of bad guitar players. <laughs> right. And uh, but they needed a tuba player in the junior high band, the typical thing. And they asked me. I had some musical training, so it came quick, and that's what I played. And all through high school, and I didn't know what to do with my life, so. <laughs> I like music more than anything else, so I went to be a, a band director, a teacher at Indiana, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. That's yeah. uh, funny thing is, I've told Perrin Tony and some of my other friends, uh, you're an Eastman man. I only lived about 100 miles away from Eastman, oh, okay. and I never heard of it. Oh, okay. I was from a small <laughs> town, an <man>, oil city. <laughs> That's cool. So when by the time you got to Catholic University, were you were you focused on becoming a tuba player at that point? Or well, were you still um, thinking about band right directing? after I got out of Indiana, I went to an army band concert in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And just on the lark, I went back and asked the tuba player principal if there was any openings. He said, yes, come down and audition. And I went to Washington. I got in the U.S. Army Band mm. in 65 and uh, happened to be a... Uh, a couple other pretty cool players in the band at the time named Chester Smiths, who mm -hmm. was with the Boston Symphony later, and Dan Parentoni. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were all young and didn't have any reputation at the time, but we look back on it, we were all there yeah, together. Yeah. And it's like an all-star tuba. Bob Planch, another great tuba player in the Army band at the time. That's so, very cool. So while I was in the Army, I got my master's, uh -huh. and they paid for it. So Nice deal. That's cool. Yeah, it was cool. Um, you moved to Los Angeles in 1974 to start what would be this phenomenal career that you're still in the middle of. Um, can you share some of your early feelings and memories about what it was like moving here and what you were, what you were kind of going through as a, as a young person trying to? Well, I had to been find a college a professor before that at the University of Tennessee for five years. Oh, okay. So in the summer, as I started coming to USC to study with Tommy Johnson. Mm -hmm. And to get coursework out, when you're a college teacher, there's a lot of heat to get doctorates and stuff like that. Sure. Way back then, it was not so much. But anyway, I was eventually I had to do a year's leave of absence to do my my uh, residency, so I took an unpaid leave, and I was out here and I was teaching a little bit, playing a very few gigs and and uh, some Fender bass gigs, quite a few, 
dance bands, you know, mm -hmm. casuals we call them here. And uh, I was making twice as much money as I was a college professor. So and I was, I'm going to school full time too. So I quit Tennessee and I, I'd only been here two weeks when, when I got to sub for Tommy on a, on a uh, TV show. And uh, I, it's, it was quite busy in the 70s with tele, in television. Sure, yeah. And then we had a strike in 1980 that devastated the industry and television particularly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, those last six years of uh, the 70s for me were a real growth period. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was room for me, if you know what I mean. There mm -hmm. was room. Tommy was so busy he couldn't do anything more. And Don Waldrop was another guy who was working. and. So, and then I started playing bass trombone, mm -hmm. like in the idea of the double, if you know what I mean, and it mm -hmm. paid money, and so. Interesting, and and uh, I want to I want to touch on a lot of the, uh, specifically on a lot of the uh, uh, soundtracks and various things uh, that you've done in the industry in LA, as a, in addition to quite a few other topics, but in general, uh, in your, you're still a busy uh, tuba player now, I mean, how, uh, how would you say the scene has evolved and changed over the, the 40 years you've been in, uh, in town? Well, unfortunately, it's not so good these days. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my career is winding down. I've had mm -hmm. a great one, and younger mm -hmm. guys are getting the gigs. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I'm still getting a few things. I worked last week on Finding Dory, the new uh, sequel to Finding Nemo, and, and I worked on, this, on the Star Wars film, too. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so there's a few things still happening, and but I'm super busy anyway with opera and specific symphony teaching and writing all kind. You know, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm in a good place with it. Mm -hmm. you know, I did my studio thing, and now I let us the younger guys handle it. <laughs> so it has changed drastically. That was your main question. Is there? Do you feel like for a young tuba player, could they come to? LA and and try to make a marking that's in the studio world is there is there they a, can mm -hmm. uh, but they have to realize it's not it's not very easy mm -hmm. they they think well you know it's tougher to get into a symphony orchestra it's not mm. you know this yes you have a one symphony job a year that's a professional quality for a tuba player in America often I mm -hmm. think it's only one this whole year mm -hmm. and. Uh, 200 people go for it of course that's we know the and mm -hmm. but the studio work is 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 it just takes a long time you have to get to know people there is a pecking order uh people want you know believe me if it wasn't a pecking order everybody would do two jobs a year and nobody would make enough money to pay their bills or have health insurance or anything else so mm -hmm. the better players or the, the long older players often have successful career because composers want to hire the same person that did well for them. Sure, that's a very good point. I'm sure they, uh, you know, you're a great example of that. You have success with uh, with John Williams or James Horner or Jerry Goldsmith. They want to see that same person uh, and they know they, can yeah, have, they and, have confidence and, that and, it's going to get done. You, you never know what, what the breaks are going to be. I, I have a, a whole thing that we'll talk about later in another thing we're going to do that uh, is how to prepare to be a tuba player in the studios and uh, it's like like anything else. You just have to be super good. You have to mm -hmm. be classically trained, but have that commercial bent too that that uh, is required. Be able to read anything. Maybe compose. Maybe uh, um, improvise. Maybe a little bit. Certainly read chord changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, these things come up occasionally. Let's put it that way. So it's versatility and uh, and uh, accuracy. You know, good rhythm. Those are the basic things. Yeah, no, no question. Well, good advice for sure. You, one of the things that I talked about just briefly in the the intro, which I, in in researching your your bio, which is uh, which was a lot of fun, by the way, just seeing all the, the cool stuff that you've done, is how many solos you've played on motion picture soundtracks, which is uh, incredible. I mean, it's like you know, and, and and when I start thinking about it, I think, oh yeah, I remember that now. And you know, you kind of uh, kind of got the cobwebs moving there, but can you talk a little bit about that? In, in particular, the work you've done with John Williams and, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I'm sure that comes up well, all the time, but I was, uh, not to interrupt you, I, I was particularly interested in how you approach as, when you know you have to play a solo on a soundtrack like that, I'm, I would imagine that the, the nerve factor gets uh, greater, but I would be interested in a seasoned professional like yourself, how do you approach well, that? Well, number one, you never know ahead of time. Mm. <laughs> you walk into the session and the music's in there 
And now, just in the last three or four years, John Williams has been sending out, uh, you know, online parts. Mm -hmm. Most ninety nine percent of the time, you show up on a job, you've never seen anything, and all the solos I've ever played in the movies, I never saw before I got there. Mm. My one story about with John Williams was Hook, the movie Hook, and um, we went out to lunch. And we came back, and it was a new cue on the stand. And it was a tuba solo, high, uh, chromatic tuba solo was hard. And and he called it up first. And, you know, I had about 50 bars to rest, and then this tuba solo about eight bars long. And it was scary. Hmm. <laughs> but it came off, you know, we made two or three takes of it, and it was came off good. It's one of the... I don't know whether you know the movie, but it's when, I they, do. Yeah, yeah, when there's, yeah. A, there's like a food fight. The kids mm -hmm. have this food fight <laughs> right. right after that. So, <laughs> That's uh, great. Do you find... Uh, or before it, I'm not sure. <laughs> when you're working with somebody like John Williams, who's, by my estimation, a genius composer and, and orchestrator and musician, um, what's the dynamic like in terms of his expectation? Is there flexibility if, if somebody's having a... a Tough time with something, or is it? Uh, well, he's he's pretty pretty understanding of that, but the level of the players that you rarely hear people not making it on the session. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Different. The people that he gets are, are really really good. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, somebody might have to go and overdub something, but it's almost almost not heard of. You know, I've never had to do that mm -hmm. with him. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, he's a wonderful man. He's he's a polite man. He's a, he's a generous man. Uh, we're so happy to have done the Star Wars film here with him again recently, and uh, all the others have been done in England. Yeah, of but because of circumstances, that was here and it was great for us. Maybe great for the business. Yeah, I would imagine that he would like to work here. I'm he sure would. there's other he, factors that are. He, causing I'm to sure go he home. wants to get up in his own bed in Beverly Hills and, and uh, drive 20 minutes to stu Sony Studios instead of in a hotel in, a, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in London that's uh, overcast and gray. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that. He's yeah. also not a young man. He's 84. So Yeah. I have to ask you about Jerry Goldsmith because I'm just yeah. such, a, such a huge fan of his music and, and for those of you who don't know uh, his writing, check out any of the, the scores that he's written. It's just like by themselves, they're just incredible pieces of music. But um, what was your experience like working with him and what are your memories of uh, his work? Well, like, like uh, uh, John Williams, Tommy Johnson was his tuba player mm. for a long time. And then, uh, in fact, Tommy was his tuba player all the way through. Mm. Uh, just to divert just a bit, the Close Encounters solo, which happened only after I'd been here two years. Oh, was that right? Tommy was on vacation, and I get this call, and I show up at Warner Brothers. There's only four musicians there, and we made up this. Didn't make it up. He wrote it, but it was kind of freely done. It was two oboes in English, or two oboes a contra, in unison, a tuba and a contrabassoon in in unison, and uh, but that's one of those lucky breaks. I Tommy was on vacation, and I got this thing, and it ended up in the movie, and uh, it was done before the film. But later on, uh, another call I got was Tommy. Actually, I heard the story. I understand was he was Gene Percorni was going to record Tubby the Tuba with a Manhattan transfer. Uh, there's four different versions of Tubby the Tuba, and with the Naples Philharmonic. So, to, for some reason, Gene couldn't do it. He asked Tommy to do it. Tommy goes to Florida for a week to record this. During this week, Jerry Goldsmith has. Dennis the Menace, which is the most tuba solos of any movie I've ever played on. Wow. It was, but it was a break for me, if you don't understand. It was mm -hmm. long after I'd been fairly busy anyway. Mm -hmm. But but that's the kind of thing it happened. Jerry was a genius. Uh, many think the most versatile of all the composers. Oh, wow. Okay. As, as incredible as John Williams is, there's a style and a sound of his music. Every score that Jerry wrote was different. Mm -hmm. Had different percussion effects, had different rhythmic things that are driving it. You know, some of them were some of them were very dissonant and uh, aleatoric, and others were uh, pretty songs and things. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, it's it's you know you speak to something you're you're a very modest, humble person, which is a great quality to have in general. But uh, 
uh, I think it's it's worth pointing out. I mean, these these breaks came to you, but then you obviously delivered. So it's like the the well, fact that you had the the preparation and the talent ready to go. That's the certainly can't undersell that. I mean, that's uh, the the, the key for, to it. I would think. For some reason, I always in, the, in earlier years I was more nervous playing a symphony concert. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't know something about that. Just it's there, and it's you know you have to. You have an audience, you can't do a second take or anything, but mm -hmm. I guess you can take a second take in a studio call, but rarely do they, I mean, you can take more takes, but you don't have to is what I mean. If right. you get it good the first time, you're cool, but you better get right. it good on a symphony concert. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, so that's that, but I, I always seem more relaxed when I play studio work. I just... And more if comfortable. You, just to kind of put a cap on the motion picture side of your career, if you had if you had to pick two or three scores that you look back on, say for whatever reason, it doesn't even have to be a solo related thing. What do you have a couple that stand out that you? Oh, uh, close and close encounters is the is the the big bird in my <laughs> my cage, you know. But uh, and Jerry Goldsmith's score, uh, I did a very interesting uh, thing on, on a movie called Lemony Snicket with. Uh, Tom Newman, mm. who, who we're working right now with on uh, Dory, Finding Dory. Um, he brought five musicians in, before, it's just, and there were just five of us. There was an electric violin, an accordion, a guitar, a percussionist, and a tuba. And we're over there at Paramount Studios. And he takes us over to the set where they're making this movie, which is sort of a, a, a dark movie made around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. And, an old haunted room building, and he wanted us to see the set. And we come back in, and we spent seven hours improvising. Wow! We made up stuff, and it was so cool. It was—I mean, I never had that experience before. The other guys were more jazz-oriented, or what do you want to call it, more comfortable as improvisers. But uh, it wasn't just that. Uh, for instance, somebody would say, uh, "I say, oh, I know, I know the." The tuba part from uh, the melody from the Lohengrin. So I start playing on the tuba. Before I know it, there's a guitar going boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. <laughs> you know, playing chords to what I'm playing. And we, we recorded this stuff, and it ended up in the movie. So that's one of my more interesting <laughs> studio <great>. experiences. <laughs> that is interesting. You've had to you've run the full gamut of them. Uh, oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Well, you touched on orchestral playing, and, and you've played with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. you played with the Chicago Symphony. You've played with the, uh, many of the orchestras here in Southern California. How do you, uh, you know, you mentioned about nerves and stuff like that. How do you feel about orchestral playing? It's been an important part of your career. Um, how did you, what's your outlook on that compared to uh, the, well, uh, the I've gotten over work. my nerves on that <laughs> after 40 years of doing okay. it. And I play a, almost every week, I'm either doing an opera or a ballet or a symphony. And I play in four different orchestras, mm. the, the best in the, in the, in the, in the town, in mm. the area. So I get to play very high quality music in good halls. Mm. And uh, uh, virtually, I played everything over these years, you know, everything of any value. And I mean, one in great tuba parts. I'm mm -hmm. looking looking forward to next season because the Pacific Symphony is doing Prokofia Five, which oh, is the nice. greatest tuba yeah. part, and the LA Opera is doing Salome. So that's a great tuba you're part. Be so busy. I, I'm gonna, I hope I have my chops good. Year. To that's, uh, a, that's a year from now. So. <laughs> that sounds great. It must have been a lot of uh, must have been a thrill to play with Chicago Symphony. Uh, and get a chance to play with that. Well, Gene's a, a wonderful person and. Uh, Good friend, and he he just invited me out. It was the Christmas week, the week they do their brass thing, and uh, and uh, they needed a second tube on Symphony Fantastic, and it, boy, that was it was a great honor because those are you know I grew up listening to Arnold Jacobs and mm -hmm. the Chicago Reiner recordings. Yeah, it's still yeah. still the industry standard in it many is. in many It is, and I mean, I, my my my, I always r r relate that. Particular was a, a month in December two thousand eight, and uh, I played a week a second tuba with Norm Pearson at the LA Phil on uh, with Dudamel mm -hmm. conducting uh, the Alpine Symphony Strauss Alp Alpine Symphony. The next week I did Planets with the Pacific Symphony. My job. And the third week I did Symphony Fantastic with Chicago. So that was, and I'm more of a <laughs> jazz commercial. What am I? I'm a symphony guy for a month. You know, you're on a roll there. On with a those real, well, that was a great week, month. Yeah, yeah I, that's awesome. 
I just wanted to echo your thoughts about Gene Bacardi. He's one of the, the classiest individuals, and I, I love him to death. And he's uh, just an incredible musician and uh, and a wonderful guy to be around. And, yes, uh, he is. A, Nobody could have filled the shoes of Arnold Jacobs better. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Uh, and he has grown into a... Well, so I knew him as a student, you know. Always had a nice sound and so on. But he grew, he, and he paid a lot of dues. He went to Israel. He went to... Salt Lake City, and then went, he went to St. Louis. I mean, right. he, he paid his dues, went up up the ladder, and uh, now he represents that high end of the symphonic tuba world. And it's a soloist too. I mean, he's yeah. he's, he's just a, uh, and he's a great teacher. Yeah, uh, I'm. Yeah, we're proud of him. He's his graduate yeah. of USC. Oh yeah, so, no, so we're yeah, very he's... proud of him. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. He's just uh, the, the class. He's still younger just, than me. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's shift gears and talk about your uh, very prolific career as a solo artist, which uh, I knew that you had many CDs out. I had no idea that you're about ready to release your 13th CD. It's really impressive, especially for any instrumentalist, but for a tuba player, that's virtually unheard of. What? What motivated you to, to get into that and, uh, and to keep going and to do all the great work you've done as a soloist? Well, I told you we had a strike here in 1980. Mm -hmm. My, I went from 39 movies in 79 to six movies in 80. Mm. And it didn't pick up for me until about 86. Six, about six years of work being slow, you know, and they were doing everything with synthesizers and any way they could do it to keep us from getting paid or getting work. So I was in a little bit of a down period mm. and I uh, I needed a project. So I made my first jazz album with, uh, I found this harmonic by Ron Kalina that just blew my mind away, his sound and the way he played bebop. And I, I says, let's try it, a tuba and harmonica and we got a guitar and a bass and a drum, we had a rehearsal. It was great. Within a month we had a, an album in the can. Mm. So my, I've always wanted to be a jazz player. I was a bass player for many years, played, and, but and I was never a good soloist on the bass, but pretty good bass player as far as time, and I knew tunes and stuff, you know. But I, I thought, I've said, I sort of gave myself a 25 year period to learn jazz on the tuba, to be a decent improviser. And sort of all those years, I just, one way to, for me to be focused is to have a, a goal that I better play good on this. This is going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? So that was it. And one thing led to another. And every couple of years, I made a maybe a, every third year, I made an album of different different kinds of things. Yeah. Well, they're really very cool. And I think uh, uh, I was checking out one of the CDs. I I can never remember the titles of the CDs, but uh, but uh, I think you probably have to be the only tuba player who has recorded Pensativa, one of the great Claire Fisher tunes. But it was so nice to hear that on. Uh, I'm that's that's on my Interplay album, which is uh, with strings. Mm -hmm. It has uh, 40 different players on it, all kinds of great players, like Pete Chrisley and Gary Foster and Dan Higgins, you mentioned yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah. And, we're, and me, it was a tuba and one sax to player, strings and rhythm sections. Right. And, I, think uh, you, I think I saw Terry Trotter played on that. Terry Trotter right? played on, uh, on that album, yeah, on that particular tune. He did, mm. like we had three different dates and one date, three tunes with these guys, you know. And the rhythm sections were all different on each date. Yeah. So I guess, and they're all the best guys, you know yeah. what I mean? I noticed my, my sadly, the late, great Dave Carpenter, who was my roommate on Buddy Rich's band, had played on, uh, on a couple Dave of those played, tracks for you. Dave, uh, Dave, was he on that track? He, I mean, he may have been. He I'm may not have sure. Been. I can't remember if he was I think on that track, was, but he was on that Yeah, I think CD he was sure. on that particular, those three tracks that we did, the Pensative, the date yeah. we did Pensative. And Gary Foster was on that. And... Uh, I've loved Pensative as long as I've known it. I, Such a I, great tune. I was a. Uh, I've always loved the bossa nova. Yeah, I, I grew up loving it, and and uh, but anyway, that's a particularly interesting tune, and I happen to know hard Cla tune. I might add. <laughs> I, I happen to know Claire, and I happen to also know. I was studying piano with Terry Trotter at the time, learning all these cool voicings and things, and and he um, he told me he says. If you're going to record uh, Claire Fisher, Pensativa, you better you get the right changes for this because he is so mad at people that have recorded his tune and and he's had a temper. Yeah, that's and and, and he would be mad at somebody if they didn't play the right changes. Like and the fake books are wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Terry happened to have 
the original manuscript that he had. So I used those changes, uh, and so go. Claire was happy. <laughs> That is great, yeah. I mean, I always think of Freddie Hubbard when I think of uh, Pensativa. Let's talk about a perfect match, getting exactly. Claire Fitcher's uh, harmony with Freddie's uh, interpretation of it. It's fantastic. Yeah. I just wanted to go back a second um, and talk about the late, great Tommy Johnson, because oh, I yeah. know he was such a pivotal force in the in the history of the tuba. Absolutely. And certainly in Los Angeles. But um, maybe you could just talk about the impact he had on you and, and your memories of, uh, of Tommy. Well, I, I I list I have three teachers that I that I put in my bio. The first was uh, William Becker, who taught in Indiana, Pennsylvania. He was a trumpet player, mm. and uh, taught me all the basics. We're still friends. He's eighty-eight years old. That's great. Right. Uh, and then I I studied with uh, Harvey Phillips in New York City mm -hmm. when I was in the Army Band. I used to commute up there. Harvey was. King of the Hill at that mm -hmm. time, I and mean, he was running fourteen jobs a day. You know, <laughs> you know, the, in the sixties. Yeah. Then I came to LA was to study with Tommy. Tommy was the hot guy out here, and he was first call for everybody. Person virtually, he played with often with Roger Bobo at the Philharmonic, and uh, he was a great person and a great, great uh, teacher. And uh, we were very close. He helped me. My career wouldn't have happened without his help. Mm. And. Uh, but uh, I, it's so sad he died uh, 16 year, or 10 years ago now, and mm -hmm. it uh, influenced a lot of people. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And he was everywhere. He was just working all the time. Yeah, I had the, the good fortune of meeting him once and playing, playing on my Brass Nation CD, and I just was so excited to, that he was there and uh, well, he, and you nervous, know, I have to say. that. Well, uh, <laughs> but he early made... on, I played a lot of two tuba jobs with him, studio calls, movies mm -hmm. with two tubas. I'd sit next to him and he'd be playing right into my right ear and it was just flawless, of course. Mm -hmm. He also played pretty good bass trombone. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. in the early days, uh, he got me into doing that. And uh, all the Hanna-Barbera cartoons are packed full of things. You know, I, I, uh, I've... And I got to do a lot of those too when he was busy, you know, mm -hmm. later on. And that's, uh, but Tommy was just uh, an amazing person, an amazing musician. Tell me a little bit about this, uh, the LA tuba quartet that you guys had in the 70s. Well, uh, it was sort of a project at the end of my doctor's degree at SC. And uh, I had to do a lecture recital. So I started, I had, I had done the world premiere of the Gunther Schuller tuba quartet. That was written at uh, basic in memory to heart to uh, Bill Bell. Okay, and yeah. it was premiered at the first international tuba conference in '73 at Indiana University. I got to play in that again. Harvey got sick the night before. They called me to play it. It was the hardest thing I ever played in my life. <laughs> hard, really hard. And you know, Gunther was a tough guy. Yeah, I mean, very picky. He wanted if you had five against seven, he expected that to be perfect rhythmically. Anyway, so I got to do that, I, and I, so I wrote a paper on this, and I wanted to perform it. So I got Roger Bobo and Tommy Johnson and Don Walter, who were the top guys around town at that time, and they all agreed to do it. And so for about four years, three years, we had a little tuba quartet, and we never made a recording, uh, that's but, we, uh, yeah. <laughs> but we did uh, some concerts, and uh, we had a good time. I bet. And, uh, <laughs> We, we played some really hip stuff, you know. I, I wanted to record some things, but we never could pull it off, you know. Yeah, that's too bad, but it's nice to know that that, uh, that would About the that. same time, yeah. New York tuba quartet was happening. I don't know whether mm -hmm. you knew about that or not with uh, Sam Palafian and Toby Hanks. Right, right. And, I did know uh, about that with Sam. And yeah. I'm trying to think who the other guys were at the moment, but they were great players. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. They actually, And they actually did record the, the uh, mm. Gunther Schuller. Oh, okay. Since then, I've expanded on this four tuba quartet, four F tubas basically. And I have students that uh, are wonderful mm. and we've commissioned lots of music. Yeah, we're gonna get to that in a second. Um, tell us about this, the fluba, this is like uh, that's, so cool. That's the only one in captivity. <laughs> the fluba, I'm not sure how I got the idea except uh, Rob Stewart is this instrument maker here in town, and he's made he makes a lot of historical brass and old uh, uh, Ophiclides and things like that. And he's just a, he's an artist, mm -hmm. and uh, he's made a couple other instruments for me too. And I asked him if he would uh, make me a tuba-sized flugelhorn because I just thought, well, this would be fun to play jazz on, you know. And 
I, like, like I told you earlier today, I says I. My what I really want to be is art farmer. See, <laughs> <laughs> but I. So well, you're, I several, you're several steps closer now. I <laughs> am, yeah. And it's 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 just it's basically an F tuba. It's got a it's compensating, like a, like a. If you can picture this valve set on a on an E flat tuba, the guy reaches around, and that's the way it is. But he set it's just set up like that, and um, it 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 plays pretty much like an F tuba. Mm -hmm. On the recording, it's a little hard to hear the difference because you're playing into a microphone. Right. But live, this goes right to the audience. Mm -hmm. So the clarity that when the tuba bell goes up this way, particularly in a commercial situation, it gets lost unless it's mic'd somehow. You know. But this way, it's a little more direct, and it's it's just fun to play. You know, I yeah. just I just sit there and think I'm Art Farmer, see, yeah. <laughs> and I know I'm not. <laughs> tell if you don't mind, tell us the story about play, about playing uh, Petrushka, the, uh, the oh yeah, solo well, on that. Uh, I play in the Pacific Symphony, which is a very fine orchestra in a great hall, and uh, we were doing Petrushka, and I hadn't done it in two or three years, and they had these old these new parts, which were didn't have the corrections that it, I was used to and so on the first rehearsal I made some clams and I won't blame it on the music yeah. but <laughs> it's a high tuba solo it's called the bear solo and uh, uh, pretty loud kind of a solo and uh, the, so I made a couple of clams I went home just for kicks I says I'm my car I'm mad at myself you know and I went home and I and I played it on this it was having me sitting up in my room and I it went great so I, I took it to the next rehearsal, and I asked this guest conductor. And guest conductors are always cool because they want to be called back. Okay. You know? <laughs> they want you to like them. They want you to like them. So he said, yeah, give it a try. Well, it went great. And I played it on four concerts and a couple more rehearsals, and uh, went perfect. Even the, the other brass players and the principal, I mean, the guy that runs the symphony, they were happy. Uh -huh. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> The new standard for Petrushka, the fluba. It it's is. Just, just give it enough well, time. It's, <laughs> it, the cool thing is that the bell goes again goes out to the audience, and when you have a solo like that, it's kind of a loud, and you know, this really makes it just go through the whole hall. You know, mm -hmm. that's great. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the writing and composing that you've done, and and the, the various ensembles, and you've been very prolific on that level as well. Uh, maybe talk about. About that part of it, you know, um, um, the big stretch is a, the CD, which has uh, you know a lot of your compositions yeah. on it. Um, but what was uh, what got you going in that direction as well? Well, one of the things I this may sound a little haughty, but I don't mean that that <laughs> way. But when I was young, I I uh, I identified somewhere in my twenties. I identified the real art in music is com composing and improvising. There's nothing else. You know, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. that's the art of the music. Everything else is recreative art. Mm -hmm. Not that mm -hmm. a, not that a great opera singer isn't an artist, but right. you know right. what I'm saying. Yeah, sure. So I wanted in, somehow in my life to get better in those fields. Okay, even though I said, "Well, I can't compose. I'm, you know, I, I can't. I have to, you have to be as good as Mozart to write." So I didn't do anything until mm -hmm. I was almost 50 years old, mm -hmm. and I started. Somebody asked me to write a little fanfare for something, and I did. And one thing led to another, and I started. I made a set on any recording I make, I'm gonna have at least one original piece on it, classical or jazz. And uh, now I've got about sixty titles, including a really cool piece for orchestra and band, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of chamber music. Mm. I have a trombone piece for two trombone and piano, oh, nice. and I wrote a uh, piece called. Um, in fact, it was just played two nights ago in Fullerton. Here, it's uh, it's called uh, uh, Pocket Change, and it's for solo bass trombone, solo big tuba, C tuba, mm -hmm. and eight trombones and drums. Wow! And uh, it's that, been played. Uh, it was played at the Picorni Festival last year here in Redlands, and it's been played in Portugal and at USC a couple times, and just this week. So I'm. It's one of my. Hipper pieces, I think. That's cool stuff. Oh, that's great. A lot of fun. A lot yeah. of notes. A lot of challenge. You know, that's a very uh, you're understating it again, but I, 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 it's very inspiring that you decided to make it. That, you know, you said almost fifty years old or past fifty, and and you got into it, and now you're look what you've accomplished on that level, and it's really a. I think the the people that really have success and and 
um, the love and gratitude in the music are like that, like yourself, like somebody who just keeps growing and keeps after it, and that, and that's an inspiring thing. I, I really well, with my to students, say. I, I don't let them fall into the trap that I, I pretty, pretty much insist on them composing. Mm. Write a tuba duet. You got six months. Mm -hmm. You know, I because I don't want them to fall into the trap that I fall in, fell into. I wasted thirty years. I maybe could be a hell of a lot better hmm. now as a composer if I'd had those 30 years of some writing, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, just kind of to shift gears again here, um, I was really, I had no idea about the, your philanthropic efforts and in, in endowing oh. these uh, um, scholarships, but it's... it's uh, Quite a noble thing that you're doing. Can you just? I know you probably don't want to talk well, too much about it, but, but tell us about that because I think it's important that people know uh, that you're doing that. I've had this amazing career, and I've done very well financially. And I got all I need. I got an airplane, mm. a half an airplane. <laughs> I used to be all mine, but I sold half of it. I have a beautiful home in the Hollywood Hills. I have another vacation home. I've got enough money, and I'm. I don't have children. I have some step-grandchildren and stuff I'm helping a little bit, but mm -hmm. I'm going to give it, most of it away mm. because uh, my wife and I have agreed to uh, mainly uh, scholarships and, and other and, and musical projects, things that, that bring people along, if mm -hmm. I can, endowments. Mm -hmm. And I have started that at uh, three different colleges now, and there'll be, there'll be more of that as I have. If I live to be 90, there may not be any money left. But, <laughs> but, uh, well, that's... Uh... God bless. That's a, a really great thing you're doing, and that's a nice, nice way to to look at it and giving at, at back U, like that. At USC, we have a, a they call it the Scholarship Brass Quintet, and it was endowed by money that was left by a, a, a Wendell Haas, a French horn player who had played in the studios, made a lot of money when he was younger, mm -hmm. and then when he died, it was in his will. Mm -hmm. I did I did this same thing at Indiana, Pennsylvania, my alma mater. I endowed a brass quintet, so there's Five guys, they're going to play for, hopefully for years and years and years. Every, you know, mm -hmm. to me, uh, I wish I had had that when I was a student. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, I wanted to, and you've kind of touched on a few of them, but I'd like to just broaden it out a little bit outside of the studio realm, but it can include the studio realm. As you look back on the, your incredible career, do you have a handful of experiences of any, any type that uh, really stand out to you that... Uh, if you had to put your signature on and say these are the these are my finest hours, any of those any of those jump out? Well, at you? I get those questions all the time, you know, and you know when you've done fifteen hundred movies, you forget which <laughs> ones you've done, you know. I did make a list on my website if somebody wants to look it up, jimself.com, to look up. Uh, I have a list of about three hundred movies of the, those fifteen hundred that I think had good tuba parts or tuba solos or really good cool scores. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a, a way to identify those things. Okay, great. So I mentioned a... Lemony Snicket earlier, mm -hmm. um, and and the Dennis the Menace and Close Encounters. Those are all big time things for me. But sure. Playing with Chicago Symphony was a, a wonderful thing. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Pacific Symphony toured Europe, and we played uh, Heldenleben in in Germany with standing ovations. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Those kind of experiences. I went to uh, Japan with. Uh, the Fujitsu Jazz Festival, one of my favorite things. We did three weeks and we played uh, concerts in all the main halls. The opening act was J.J. Uh, Johnson's Quintet. And he, nice. And guys, <laughs> mostly guys from New York. Ray Brown Trio was the second act. Wow. And the third act was Mel Torme and Marty Pate's Dectet, which I was playing in. They had a tuba in that group. And it was like first class. We were treated like rock stars almost, you know what I mean? It was fun. Jack Sheldon was there, <laughs> Gary Foster and Warren Looning. And it was a wonderful group. Wow, what and, a great experience. And uh, Marty Page, too, some of my favorite Marty wrote charts. a great thing. And there's, there's a, we did a live album in Tokyo. And at the very end, we did this one tune at the very end. I was scared. I, I don't know why I did it, but at the very end of one of these tunes, I... There was a held chord. I just went, doo 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 You know, I did that, but I'm just a tuba thing, see? And I never did on any, it was the last concert, and it was live recording, okay? And Mel turns around, and he says, and Jim Self on the tuba. And and it's on the album. Oh, that's great. So that's, oh, that's, that's a thrill. 
I've had so many great experiences. I, um, I it's not fair. <laughs> no one should have uh, these good. Well, breaks. I think I think, yeah, I think you've deserved them all, and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's great, and you're still still having at it, which is uh, extremely inspiring. I don't know other, any other way to live. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd be happy, uh, not growing, mm -hmm. not learning, not being productive in some way. I, yeah. I'm, I'm at an age where I worry about that a little bit, you know, about how I'm going to fill up the rest of these years. Well, you seem to be doing it, and I, th I know I speak for all of us in the low brass world. We look forward to uh, all your future endeavors and uh, keeping track of it. Um, as we close out, Jim, um, I always kind of ask this because I think it's important for younger folks uh, to just get a sense from somebody who's had the, the, the highest level of success. If you look back on it and, and you were going to offer a couple of, or maybe just one singular piece of advice to young folks coming up now, and I know that the scene is different and we all, you know, we all kind of identify that that's it, but I still think it's important for people, if you have a passion for music, a real passion, then you got to go for it. And, and what would you recommend to, to young? And I'm sure you get this question all the time with your students. At an early age, start writing. Start improvising. Uh, learn melodies. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the tuba players. Mm -hmm. Tuba players are notoriously terrible at, at playing melodies. Mm -hmm. We're not. We don't have to in the uh, in most of what we do. Uh, I would recommend those things. Learn mm -hmm. piano, mm -hmm. key, keyboard. It's a valuable thing. I, it's, it's, I'm, I'm talking about things that I wish I'd done better when I was young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, they have affected me negatively in a way in my career. I would, would have been, some things would have come easier for me, let's put mm -hmm. it that way, if mm -hmm. I had had those experiences. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, Jim, thank you so much. Well, it's thank you, Mike. It's been great having you on. And uh, everybody check Jim out at jimself.com. Also, bassethoundmusic.com, right? Yeah, the, the same, same website. website. Yeah. So uh, we'll look forward to uh, following all your endeavors as you go forward. Well, it's a great honor, Mike, to be part of this uh, very classy series you have. Thank you very much. It's, you're very kind to say so. We appreciate it, Jim. Thank you all, and we will see you next time on Bone to Pick.